Here's part two of our conversation, our entire conversation. This is the second and last part of Lou Graham, the former great voice of Foreigner. By the way, you, you, have, uh, you have this little word that you're very familiar with. The considering your work ethic, I always call that good old fashioned grit and not a lot of people have grit. That's why second album sometimes, you know, people, you, you spend your whole life doing your first album and your second album, you have like a six months or something like that. But about your work ethic, did your parents give you that? Are, were you born, was it nurture nature? It's hard to have grit. Not everyone can follow through all the time. I'm, I'm sure I got a great deal of it from, from my mom and dad. And, and um, I think the rest of it I, I developed because I was, I was hungry to, 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 be in in the in the big time rock scene you know i was bubbling under with black sheep we had two albums we were on our way and, and tragedy struck you know but 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 it wasn't it wasn't three months later that mick called me and i was in new york auditioning and, and on our way to our first big album See, you know, Warner, so it was very exciting times. You guys had like one great album after another great album, which, you know, and that's grit to me. That's the fact that I'm going, I'm not going to rest on my laurels. I'm, you know what? We got to work harder. I see a bigger vision. It's, you, you know, uh, um, in the back, we, we, we travel on a bus. We were doing bus tours. There was a big lounge in the middle of the bus. And then the bus driver was in the front. Then there was a small back lounge. And, and whether we were driving to a show, from a show, or, or it was two o'clock in the morning and we were leaving the show to go to the next city. Mick and I would be in the back room with a little uh, 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 four track, they had four track cassette players that you could overdub. So he would, he would play bass guitar, then rhythm guitar. I would sing the melody and we'd both sing the harmony and we'd have a drum machine. And we were, we were working on ideas for our next album. That is crazy. I want to know what love is. You were a big part of the writing of that song. Uh, how did that go down? Um, Mick had a when I I, I, had, I I moved from 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 Croton on Hudson to a place called Katona, which was a sweet little town. Well, it was a city actually, but it was very small. And, and uh, I had a nice house with with a couple two acres. And, and uh, it, it was just a beautiful place to live. And Mick bought a house in Bedford Hills, which was an exclusive, exclusive part of the area. And his home was uh, two, $3 million. It had uh, 15 acres. It had, had uh, uh, eight bedrooms. And, you know, as, as nice as my house was, he made my place look like a shack. Okay. And so... He would go up, he and his family would go up there for weekends. You know, he spent the week in the city and on the weekends he would, he would go north to, Bed, to Bedford Hills and, and stay at his mansion. And that's where he and I would work. It would take me less than 10 minutes to drive from my house to his house in Bedford Hills. And, and, and just like the old days, I would arrive there around dinner time. I'd have dinner with him and we'd immediately go into a little tiny room with his equipment and his tape machines and stuff and a mic for myself. And we would work on song ideas. And that's, that's where he, he played me the intro to I Want to Know What Love Is. And, and on, on a cassette player. And, and uh, after the intro, he started playing the chords of the verse and I could hear in the background him humming a little little melody, you know. And and he goes, "Don't pay any attention to that." He goes, "I just I was just fooling around." But, but I liked what he had put down, you know. And we we started to work on the song. And, and he had the big, he had the vision for the song, you know, because it was his idea. But but I was contributing phrase phrases. And some some lyrical lines, and, and some arrangement lines, but the big thing is, when we went into the studio to record it, uh, a friend of his, uh, a, a, a really cool black gentleman, 
came in and said that he was working at an all black uh, gospel label. And he listened to, to what we had recorded so far. And he says, that song needs, needs a gospel choir. He says, it's beyond a ballad. It, it's, it's ethereal. It, it, it's, it, it has, it has a, a gospel overtones all over it. And we, had, we hadn't even thought about that. So, so he says, I've got a gospel choir from New Jersey on my label. He says, I'd like to send them over here and, and you work on some parts with them and, and just let them sing, you know? And um, so, so, so while Mick was in one studio, you know, a, a, a studio complex has usually two or three studios with it. So he was in one studio working with the choir, okay? I was in another studio with, with another engineer singing the song by myself. Usually when I sing a song, Mick's in there, he's always noodling with my melodies or my nuances. No, try this, Lou, try this, try that, you know? And, and I was just singing my heart out, okay? Nobody to criticize or suggest anything. Just leave me alone, let me sing. And I did. And the, 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 the recording that you hear on that song, I did that by myself, just me and an engineer. And when I came back and played it for Mick, he, he was like, oh, that's nice. And then he went back to working with the choir, you know? And, and uh, he, he never even really, really paid much attention to it because he was consumed with making sure the choir was right. And, 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 and at, at that point, I helped him with it. But, but quietly, that, that lead vocal part, with all the ad-libs and everything, uh, uh, became, became the, the, the crux of what that song was built on, including the ad-libs from the choir at the end and everything like that. That, that was all based around the vocal that, that, that I had accomplished by myself with, with no input from anybody. And, and I, I thought that that was a big accomplishment for me because I usually can't sing two notes without him uh, uh, adjusting something or try this, try that, try this, try that, you know? And, and uh, it, it was a, a, a real interesting and exciting experience to be left alone, mm -hmm. my own devices, to sing a monumental song. And, and uh, so the song was complete and, and, and it, it sounded fantastic. And usually towards the end of an album, when, when most of the, when all the songs are recorded, Mick and I would go into uh, an office or something like that. And, and we would take little post-it notes and write down each song and what we thought our share of the song writing should be. Now we've been doing this since the first album and, and usually we're, we're very close, you know, he might say we had a, a lot of 50 50 split songs right a lot of them but sometimes I, you know i i would feel that he contributed more than me and i would put down mix 60 lou 40 and and a lot of times he would have the same thing down you know and and we never had we never had if, if our thoughts were different we would always split it down the middle and and be happy you know mm -hmm. because we were so 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 thrilled with our songwriting accomplishments that we had a very potent team. But I want to know what love is. When we first wrote, wrote on, on the post-it notes what we thought it should be, I had 60 Mick, 40 Lou. He had 80 Mick, 20 Lou. Um, so then I, 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 so then we scratch that off and we do it again. And I had 70 Mick, 30 Lou. You know what he had? 95 Mick, 5 Lou. Okay. 
I, I don't know why why he it was it was like he wanted us to cut my throat or something. I I, I don't know where ninety five five came from. The song was going to be a massive hit. It turned out way past our expectations. Uh, I had a, I had what I feel is a landmark vocal on it for him that he didn't even have to be a part of. You know, your biggest song. Yes, and and, and so it went from. You know, 70, 75, 25 to 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 ninety five five, and and I, I was looking at him. It was very hurtful. I says, I says, really? I said, I says, what's prompting you to to do this? He goes, I'm thinking about it, and that's what I think. You had said before that it was the beginning of the end for you, eh? Yes, it was, and, and I had feel I felt totally betrayed. And I says, Mick, I says, why, why are you even bothering with the five? I says, I know you want the whole thing. Just take the whole thing, Mick. It'll have just your name on it. You know, the way you like it. And, and that was the end of that. And he took the whole thing. And, and with that song, he, made, he upped his publishing deal another $3 million. Okay? Because that song was so big. His publishing me deal was substantial, you know, compared to mine. Uh, uh, mine was very modest. And after he he had 100% of I Want to Know What Love Is, that was a number one song around the world, mm -hmm. his publishing deal went up $3 million, plus the royalties he was getting in, 100% of the royalties. And, and I felt ultimately... Uh, uh, betrayed and 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 uh, manipulated, and that 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 what he did to me was, was an act of greed, a hundred percent greed, and, and that he wanted all of the the credit for that song. And that's exactly what he got. It was number one around the world. People were piling accolades on him. It won him a Grammy. I mean, I sang the song. I never got a Grammy. Grammy went to Mick. I says, don't I get one too? I says, I sang the song. Does that count for anything? Apparently not. What's your relationship uh, with him now? Well, I'll, I'll get to that. So, so that that threw a wrench in in the relationship. The tour was was okay but 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 there was no camaraderie you know i i i i didn't feel any camaraderie from him him he he was uh the guy that stabbed me in the back you know so we performed and we pretended on stage but but off stage we we kept our distance there was no there was no writing new songs in the back room there there was no playing euchre until three in the morning there was none of that you know we were bandmates, but but by contract only. And uh, when it came time to do the next album, he played me four songs that were complete. Lyrics, uh, uh, music, melody, and arrangement. And he said to me, he says, listen to what I sang. He says, and do it verbatim like that. Melody, words, everything. He says, he says, you don't even have to think about it. Just do it. So that those songs were his 100%. I was only a little piece, just the voice, just the voice of the song, you know, nothing important. And, and uh, so, so after that beginning to the, to the album, when it came time to, when there was room for me to, to contribute, I didn't. Mm -hmm. At that point, I didn't want anything to do with the album. Kind of like, it's kind but, of like it takes your heart out of it almost. Yes, it does. And, and, and you know what the first song on that album that, that, that was written and that the band recorded 
I don't want to live without you. A ballad. So there were some pretty good rock songs on there. You know, and towards the end, I did contribute a little bit. But the first single was That Was Yesterday, which is a good song. Mm -hmm. Second single was I Don't Want to Live Without You. I think number one around the world again. And again, accolades for being such a great songwriter. And the money was pouring in for him. And, and at that time, I, I, at the end of that, I was, I was, I was really, really uh, bitter. And, and uh, I, I honestly didn't want anything to do with him because, because I felt he was not, not only betraying me, but, but purposely cutting me out from the inner circle, you know, that, that he used me to a point and, and then after he made a huge hit on his own with, I want to know what love is that he was going to do it again with, I don't want to live without you. And he did do it again. And I had nothing to do with that song. And, and, and you know what? I didn't even sing that song the best way I could. I, I did a, a very slight imitation of Dean Martin. I sing that song like, I don't want to live without you. And, you know, it, it was it was a it was a put on. It wasn't really Lou Graham singing. It, it was it was Lou Graham pretending I was Frank or Tony. You know. Yeah, but and, you still did a really good job. It was it was a good job, but but if you listen closely, it it, it was mimicked a little bit, you know, and, and and he never caught it, but I knew what I knew what I was doing, you know, and. and and after that happened, and it went over one, I, I, I think I think the the album after that, the, the I had I had very few contributions, and, and and I wouldn't even I wouldn't even tour to support that album. I quit the band. Mm -hmm. That'll do it. That'll do it. Yeah, but you came back. Um... Well, he 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 and his wife. After that, he and his wife, and I think his his two younger kids went on an ocean tour that that went around the world. I think he was on tour uh, uh, on the liner for five and a half or six months, you know, with various stops at different cities and retooling and refueling and all new new stuff that they brought on for food and stuff. It was a it was a real real uh, uh, ocean going vessel that that that. You know, when when you when you think of being a, being on one of those ships, you think a week or ten days, and and they dock and you fly home. He was gone a long time. In the time that he was gone, I wrote and recorded my first solo album with, with my own players. That is a great record, by the way. Midnight Blues, my, of all the Foreigner songs and your solo songs. Midnight Blue of all those songs is my favorite song. Awesome. Thank you so much. And, and I wrote that in the same basement with, with me playing guitar. And, and my fingers are fat. And a lot of times I'd hit two strings instead of one when I'm fingering it. But, as soon, but then I went on piano and I played the right chords that are supposed to be there. And... and wrote 90 percent eight well about 75 percent of the song and, and called in my friend bruce turgan who was in black sheep with me and at that time bruce was now in four i got bruce in foreigner right and and um so he came in heard what i was struggling with uh, on my lame guitar playing and and my very crude piano playing and picked up a guitar and played the chords like they're supposed to be played with attitude so he he played that guitar on on the song you know my following days are over now i just got to follow through is one, one of the greatest lines of all time for me i love that line that that's again one of those lines that made me stop and go what what did he just say so so so, so get this 
we were writing that song and and when I knew that there was going to be another Foreigner album coming up. So when Mick finally got back from his ocean tour, whatever it was, uh, Bruce and I took Midnight Blue and Heartache, the song Heartache, mm -hmm. over to him and proposed that those two songs be on the next Foreigner album. Now they were done. There was no room for for Mick on there. You know, they were done. It basically was Bruce and myself. And, and he heard the rough, the rough tape of, of Midnight Blue. And, and he had a funny look on his face, you know. And he picked up his guitar and tried to play those chords. They're very strange fingering on, on that. And Mick is the master of that. I watched him try and duplicate those chords for 20 minutes and finally just take his guitar and put it down. And, and, and he says, then he said, it's all right, but I don't think it's for us. It's one of my all time favorite songs, man. I, I mean, it would not take a genius to pick up on what that song had and say, even if I can't play guitar, I'll learn the right chords. That's a foreigner song. Let's play it. Yeah. But but he he turned it down. And I, and I think I think he knew it was a good song, but because it didn't come from him, he didn't want anything to do with it. Okay? Yeah. That's the long and the short of it. That 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 basically he was saying to me, you're fortunate that you're part of some of the big foreigner songs. But but this song was written by you and Bruce. It had nothing to do with me. I don't want anything to do with it. And he dismissed it. So and the song went to number five yeah. in the charts and was the billboard most played rock song for that year over. I can't find what I'm looking for by you two over two or three other songs that you would think were, were awesome, awesome hits. Midnight blue topped those songs in airplay. Yeah. And I was so very proud of it and the whole first album. How did Mick react to, did he ever talk to you about the first, your, your first album? Did he ever? He, he was, he was very angry, very angry that I, I wrote songs and recorded an album and released it on Atlantic and held him and the rest of the band up from releasing the next four album. Basically they had to wait when my album was released another three or four months until it started to die down mm -hmm. be before, because I, I was touring to support that album. You know, he says, he says, we're ready to go here, Lou. We, we want to write songs. We want to get ready to record our next album. I said, Mick, I says, I've learned a lot from you over the years. And if there's one thing I remember that I've learned is when you put out an album, you go on the road and support that album or don't even bother making albums. I said, so I'm doing what I learned from you. And when I'm done, I'll be ready to record. And that's what happened. Jeez. Well, how did the ending come? How did the, that ultimate ending happen? The ending came after I recorded Long Hard Look mm -hmm. and, and promoted it with a short tour. I told Mick that, that, that I didn't want to be part of the band anymore. What did he say? He said, he says, I've known that for a while. He said, really? He says, yeah. He says, and that's okay. We've got a singer already. That's what he told me. Was that Kelly? Johnny Edwards. Oh, so I, I, I'm not familiar with him. Uh, inside information. Oh, Realm, inside information. Yeah. Yeah. And they had an album out in two or three months and it completely panned. I don't think it even made it to the top 100 on the album charts. It may have been in the, in the eighties for a couple of weeks and then fell off. No hit singles, no, no album charts. I think they went out and toured on it, but, but, but I think 
It was mostly because of the old hits that, that they got anybody at all in their audience. What did that tell you? We know what it told you. It, it confirmed what I'd hoped. And, and that was that he was not the only talent in the band. And, and that after 15 years or so, I don't have to follow him like a puppy dog. I can do what I want to do. And it's, it's, it's infectious quality music. Yeah. So why, why did you come back? Why did you come back for the, uh, to, to, when in the last few years you came back? Uh, well, I came back after that because I got reports from, from friends of mine who went out and heard Foreigner with the new singer that, that it was bad. That he, he was not a, not a great singer live and his voice didn't hold up after a couple, two or three shows. He was going on stage with, he was hoarse and, and couldn't hit many of the notes at all, even in, in the regular part of the song. And, and that, that, that in a lot of situations, like I had a couple of friends who heard them in Las Vegas. At the end of the songs, they were being booed or, their, or the song would end and there was no clapping, no cheering. It would just end and there'd be a sick silence until they started the next song. And so after I finished my second album and toured to support it a little bit, I was still, even though I wasn't part of the band, I was still loyal to Foreigner. And I didn't want to see what I had participated, what we had built, go to hell. So, so uh, I, I um, talked to Mick and, and told him that, that I, I had accomplished what I set out to do with my solo albums. And, and that's all I wanted to do. And, and uh, uh, is there a chance I could be part of Foreigner again? And uh, we, we met in, in Los Angeles during the LA riots. And we you know, people were, con it was martial law. People were off the streets. They were confined to their homes or their hotels. And we went between his hotel room and my hotel room and talked uh, about six or seven hours a day for three or four days. And at the end of that, we had a, a, a reasonable understanding. I told him uh, I wanted more input in the songwriting. I wanted to be a force in the direction of this band. You know, I've been, I've been, other than him, I've been a big part uh, of the creative process of this band. And, and I deserved to have a little more input and, and fealty in, in where the band goes. And I got that out of him. He agreed, you know. And, and so, excuse me, the next couple of years, we just toured and wrote songs. And, and uh, by then Atlantic was going through a lot of inner turmoil. All the people that helped to make Foreigner either retired, were retired or were pushed out of their position and replaced by up and coming young, young kids, basically, you know, kids in their early twenties, mid twenties, who had very little uh, um, experience for the position they held. And their intent was to get new blood in Atlantic. And they went out signing grunge bands and yeah. uh, all sorts of different variety of, of different new music bands and they literally pushed the old guard off to the side. And we asked for our release. We, we knew that as much as they helped us throughout our career, that, that they were done helping us. We were, we were dead meat to them. Mm -hmm. So we were looking around for a new label. We, we, we knew that, uh, there were a couple new big labels that were starting up 
that that had a slew of of classic rock acts, and, and we we uh, were playing them demos of our new songs and 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 talked to them about being a part of the label. And, and uh, I don't know the reason, but e either we weren't enamored with them or they weren't enamored with us. Mm. And we couldn't find an established label to go on because what Atlantic was doing, they were all doing with the new, new acts, you know? So we ended up signing with an independent label on the West coast, a guy with a lot of money and, and, and swore that his, his label was going to, was going to have new acts and classic rock acts and not just let the classic rock acts wallow in their their former glories, but but he wanted new material and and a new lease on their professional life. And and that sounded great, great to us. So we signed. I think it was called Rhythm Safari. They they, they had a couple uh, uh, new acts that that did very well for them. So we recorded. Oh, Mr. Moonlight. Mr. Moonlight. Yeah, yeah. We, we recorded most of that in Woodstock, New York. And it, it really turned out great. The songs were fantastic. I had a, had a bigger hand in the songwriting. Uh, um, I, I was given some room in the production to, to, to influence it. It, it, was, it was a... For the most part, it was a stripped down rock album, heavily influenced by, by the Beatles. And, and the songs were, were, were terrific. And, and the last two or three songs, there was, there was actually a, a ballad that I love on that album, you know, that I, I wish would have been a single. And, and there were some real heavy songs. There was an instrumental on it. And as it turned out, Rhythm Safari had big dreams, but what they didn't have is a promotional department. Mm. Kind of important. And, yeah, and, and we thought they did because they bragged about that too, but, but when it came right down to it, we, we weren't seeing records in the stores. We weren't getting radio airplay unless we took the album to a station and did an interview and let them play three or four of our old songs. Then they would play about half of one of the new songs and fade it out. Thanks, Lou and Mick, for coming by. And, and you never heard a song from them again, mm -hmm. from the new album. So, so basically, an album that I would put right up with, not, not with four or, 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 or maybe double vision, but... It, it was a damn good album, and, and it, it really, uh, I felt that it was a, one of our better albums. It, it, it never saw the light of day. You know, a, a few people, by the way, I had mentioned, I asked the fans again, I got a few questions for them, and, and that album came up an awful lot. Just to, Fans wanted to let you know that they really liked that album. They really did. And I did have it. I remember now. I did have that album. Yes. Uh, what's the relationship with Mick now like? And by the way, what do you think of Kelly, their singer? Two questions. Uh, Kelly is all right. He's a good singer, but, but, but I think Mick really told Kelly when he first got in the band that he had to study me because he sings those songs with the same musical innuendos and, and vocal licks and ad libs as I have. He, he's, he's mimicking me. He, his voice doesn't sound like me, but but he's singing the song the, the way I would sing them, you know? And, and I don't, you know, some people say, well, take it as a compliment, Lou. I don't take it as a compliment. You know, you're a singer with a big band like that. Use your voice and your style. Don't, don't hang your coat on my hook. Yeah, but do you think the, fa the fans would accept that? that, that uh, um, or do you have more faith in the fans that maybe they want? Yeah, I, I mean... Uh, I, I, I don't I don't think he should sing the songs verbatim like me, you know, maybe sing a couple parts, but but let his own influences show, show the fans that he's the new singer. No, not me. 
What was it like? Uh, what was it like when you were sharing the stage with him when you came back for those select shows? It, it, it was okay. He 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 was bouncing off the walls. You know, he 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 couldn't stand still or sit still. Uh, I couldn't get on after a song ended. I couldn't even get in a word to thank the audience or tell them that I was happy to be part of the reunion. At, at the end of the song, the last note hit, and and there wasn't a quarter of a second of space before he was yapping away to the audience. Hey, you know, it, it, it was like, geez, will you quiet down for a minute? So is that over now? Is that over now for you and Forner? I think so. Yeah, I don't want to be part of it. Well, you know, Ian has passed away and, and Ed Gagliardi passed away, even though he wasn't part of the reunions. Two original members of, of the six are, have now gone. Yeah. And Mick is in very poor health. I think when for, when the new foreigner plays, I've heard that he comes on for one song and then waves and goes off stage. Yeah, I'd heard he wasn't there for the whole thing. I didn't I didn't know it was one song. I but uh, yeah, it, it was. It, he would play the whole last half of the set, but but then he was in the hospital again for weeks. He he had some some heart problems. And. and and his recovery time was was very long and tedious. And, and I've heard that he comes on for one song now. When he comes on, most of the time, Foreigner has no original Foreigner members in it. Why do you think, and I know you watched 2020, and I know you saw the doctor talking about the tumor uh, in your head, and he's you were told that it was not operable. You watched that show. You went to visit him. Uh, some Some of the fans had said, you know, he should be dead. A lot of rockers should be dead and they're not. But but here you are. Uh, you know, I know it was a long recovery for you. You had to like write some of the lyrics down and stuff. But why do you think you're still here? Because this is what I was meant to do. You know, I mean, I was 40, 47 years old when, when, when I went under the knife for that tumor. And... and my doctor told me, he says, he says, this was a very fragile uh, uh, operation. He says, he says, I know what you do for a living. He says, and, and I think that's fantastic. He says, but you shouldn't be doing any of that for at least a year and a half until we see how things settle in your brain and your brain, you know, builds up some kind of uh, strength and resistance to, to what you're going to put that brain through with the volume and you went back I fast. Told, you went I was back. told, I was told by management that they canceled shows when I had to go in for my operation. And, and while I was in the hospital, they rescheduled the shows and they, they couldn't cancel them again, or we'd be up for lawsuits. So I wasn't out of the hospital two weeks and I was flying to Japan and I had all the words to all the songs written with a marker and taped in a semicircle in front of me because I, I usually could start the song off fine, but by the second verse, I didn't know what I was going to say. Well, what and condition had... were you in? What condition were you in after a show? Did you just like, yes. And a lot of times after a show, we would get on the bus. And I had the back lounge while, while they were, you, you know, I was also, I, I had been clean and sober for about six or seven years. And nobody else in that band was. And, and so I had the back lounge to myself, a small back lounge, TV, you know, I have some snacks and, and a, and a, some soft drinks or something. But when I had to go use the restroom, I came out of that lounge and, and they were playing Euchre, just like I used to with them. Uh, uh, and uh, as I was heading to, towards the restroom, I'd see everybody going, come on quick, you know? And I, I'd use the restroom and when I'd come out, they, one or two of them would stand up and throw their arms around me and, and tell me that, that they're so happy that 
I pulled through the operation and I was okay to play, but I really wasn't. Yeah. And, 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 and then, and then they said, and we're so glad you're clean and sober. We were really worried about you. And I, and I looked at a table and I see the lines and the Stoli bottles and everything. Uh, and I kind of rolled my eyes up to the back of my head and I said, thanks so much for that. And walked back to my, my little room. Wow. Oh, by so, the way, so I, I was isolated and, and because I was clean and sober, ostracized. Yeah. For of all that, things. That being tour clean was, a, was a tour for, for, from hell for me. Yeah. It was horrible. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. If, uh, would you go? I, 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 I think I would go, but, 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 uh, I, I, cause you know, they want you to go. I mean, the fans I, would want no, you to I go. I don't know that. I don't know that. They've never said that to me. Uh, uh, for some reason there there's bad blood with foreigners, old management and Mick because, because apparently Mick and our, and our, and our old manager didn't thought that we should have been in the hall of fame when, when, when they had all our peers in, and we're now moved on to another generation of rockers and they completely ignored us. So, so Mick and our manager went in there and apparently had a big blowout with, with the, the head of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and, and a couple of the, the executives there. And it ended up that they told Mick and our manager, I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you do. It'll be a cold day in hell when you'll be in the Rock Hall of Fame. That's what that's what they, that's what they accomplished. Okay. Wow. And, and Mick was close friends with what's the guy from Rolling Stone? Uh, Jan Werner. Or Werner. Or... Yeah, they were they were close friends. Their wives were close friends. They were always out dinner in a bar or going to a live rock show or something. They, they were inseparable. After that little to do, they haven't spoken since. And that, that had to be about 14, 15 years ago. Oh, sorry. One last thing. Uh, Shadow King. Uh, uh, so many people wanted me to ask you, why did that band uh, end? The band ended because we got no support from Atlantic. None. No, no promotion for that killer. Did you hear the album? Yeah. Wasn't it a good album? Yeah. Great good album. Uh, very heavy, very melodic. It, it should have been a huge hit. Atlantic didn't support it at all. Didn't promote it. Uh, 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 we played one. Sh we should have been on tour for months. We played one show at at at, at a at a, at a club at a rock club in London. I'm trying to think what what the name of the place was. I can't think of it. it escapes me. And, and the place wasn't it was recorded. It was recorded, right? Yes, it was. Yeah. And it was wall to wall people. And, and, and the show went down a storm. That was our one and only show. We never got on a tour in Europe or in the States. Atlantic didn't promote the, I, I, I went to so many stores and was thumbing through that section. And I'd see all the foreigner albums, maybe one of my two solo albums and nothing from Shadow King. And I know who, who commiserated with, with Atlantic executives to keep that, to stifle that album. That, that album not getting recognition to me is a crime in music. It's a crime. But, but there's people who can, can talk to the Atlantic executives and make that happen. Yeah. yeah. Do I need to name him? No, that's the way I mean. <laughs> it's okay. Because he told them that, that if Shadow King goes big, Lou will, Lou will never consider coming back to Florida. And it was after that that I went back and we recorded Mr. Moonlight. Okay, but, I'll probably. I, 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 was, I was sick for months about it. The, the, you know, the guy who produced the album, it was, it was uh, uh, the guy who did Double Vision, Keith Olsen, mm -hmm. produced Shadow King. Mm -hmm. It was an exemplary album. The production was killer. It, it had everything going for it. And it never even, you know, if, if it had marginal success, it would have been something, but but there's so many people when I mentioned Shadow King that go they go Shadow who? 
A lot of people mentioned it when I asked. A lot of people mentioned that band when I asked. I want to thank Lou Graham for talking with us. What a what a great conversation. It's rare when you get a chance to talk to a guy of that caliber and to talk for 90 minutes. The the word was you've got about 20 minutes, but if it's going well, just follow Lou's lead. And we did, and it man, there you go, 90 minutes. Hope you enjoyed that. Remember, there's now a link where you can help support us. In the very top of all the descriptions of the videos and podcasts, it's to PayPal. If you want to support Rock History Music, we'd appreciate that. Make sure you comment on our videos, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Music.